Well, hello. I want to thank you all again for coming out today. I know that everyone's busy. We all have full agendas. And so it helps to be able to just step away every once in a while, you know, get out of our regular environment and think um, a little more strategically about what we do with our websites. And I hope that we're able to help you do that today with regards to the content of your site. For those of you who haven't met me, my name is Kendra. I've been working here with the Georgia Gov team for about 10 years, um, eight of those here in Atlanta. And um, in my current role, I work as a project manager for onboarding projects. Some of you know me as your um, account manager for your website. I also oversee all of the Drupal training efforts and the support efforts. And then I also get a full view. Um, I'm involved in the platform development, so whenever we make new changes to the platform. So this is really nice, right? This gives me a full view of what's going on with our platform, with um, our agency's challenges, right? I kind of get a sense of what you guys are dealing with with your content. And um, also to think about our users' needs, the people who are accessing the site. So you know that at GeorgiaGov, we serve two different customer bases, right? We serve you, our agencies. But we also serve all of those constituents that are coming to your websites. So we really see ourselves as champions of those visitors. Um, so you'll know when you come to us and you say, hey, we, you know, our commissioner wants this new thing, or we have an idea for a great new feature. We don't just say, all right, sure. I mean, the commissioner wants it, whatever you want, right? We first start asking questions. We say, well, um, you know, tell me more about it. What are we trying to accomplish? You know, is this the way that's going to serve those constituents' needs? And um, if not, you know, what can we do that will really help um, to serve those needs, to meet your commissioner's needs and our users' needs, right? So I think a lot about the challenges that we face in training our agencies, encouraging best practices for the websites, and also encouraging you all to act as champions for those same visitors. Um, especially when the commissioner comes up with a great new idea for your website. I know that for most of you, managing your website is not your full-time job, right? You do a lot of other things. You also take care of your website. And so you have to prioritize. You have to pick your battles. My goal today is actually to tell you why I think this, making your um, website accessible, making accessible content, should be one of your top priorities. At our last GovTop talk, I think a lot of you were here, our friends at AMAC came and talked about accessible, about um, people with disabilities and ways to make things accessible. They talked about different types of disabilities and the importance of serving all of our constituents regardless of those abilities. So I want to do just a quick recap, right? When we talk about disabilities, we're not just talking about blind users or deaf users. We're talking about a range of disabilities. So, for visual, there's blindness, but there's also low vision and um, color blindness, right? 10% of men in America are colorblind, so that's a pretty broad range right there. We talk about auditory issues, there's um, a range of hearing loss. For motor skills, some people have trouble using a mouse, some people have trouble using a keyboard, some people are using touch screens, some auditory commands, so there's a lot of different things there. For cognitive disabilities, you want to think about um, things like dyslexia, um, visual comprehension, memory loss. And then remember that seizures can be trig triggered by um, flickering, blinking, and moving text. So a lot of different things to think about. And really, as civil servants for the state of Georgia, we're serving constituents across a full spectrum of abilities. So it's important to be mindful of that as we write out our content. This is my friend Beth. I actually went to college with Beth um, way back in the day. <laughs> and um, she's a painter and a muralist. But a few years ago, Beth developed chronic fatigue syndrome. So she's barely been able to leave her bedroom for the last, I think, about five years now. She has a severe sensitivity to sound. So you'll notice that she actually has um, earplugs in because just noises around the house can just really um, wear her out, actually. Um, talking is exhausting, so she whispers a little bit here and there, but mostly just relies on hoping that her parents remember what she needs because any sort of conversation can wear her out. Um, and her muscles ache and spasm all day. So now she spends most of her days exactly like this. 
But like I said, Beth's a painter. So in those short bursts of energy that she gets, she actually alternates between painting, now she has to do that on a really small scale, um, and interacting on her computer. So Beth's an extrovert who's <laughs> trapped in these four walls. So she really uses her computer and things like Facebook to interact and reach out and use that as her outlet. Um, when she paints, she has to actually have ice packs on her shoulders to keep her muscles from spasming too much. And as soon as they warm up, her mom has to come and trade them out with new ice packs. So nothing she does is very easy. When she is using something like Facebook, when she gets too tired to type, she'll just use emojis instead. Like many people with chronic illnesses, this is one of the paintings she's working on, um, Beth stuck trying to navigate the public health care system by herself. So her parents are her primary caretakers, but they're aging, they're suffering with their own memory loss issues. They're actually not a lot of help anymore. So she has to do all of this navigating the system all on her own. She needs her public websites to be as quick and easy to navigate as possible so she can find and access what she needs within those short energy allotments. Um, and she needs to be able to perform as many of those tasks as possible online from her computer because as we said, talking on the phone is basically impossible right now. She can't go anywhere to meet with somebody. I tell you this because I want you to think about the fact that we're really serving real people with real issues in our jobs. That's a really nice thing about our jobs is that we're focused on helping people. And for a lot of people, like Peter said, our website is the face of that organization. So let's make sure that we can help our users find and use the services that we provide as quickly and easily as we can. What's awesome is that we're the people who can do that, right? Accessible websites serve everyone, not just users with dis disabilities, because accessible websites are search engine friendly websites. So if you think about it, a search engine spider, that um, little robot on the computer that goes through and indexes all of your websites for the big Google, um, that search engine spider, it can't see images without text behind it explaining what it is. Um, it can't understand the content of an image without that representation. And they're deaf to audio files, deaf and blind to video files. You have to provide the search engine spider all of that text information for it to know how to index it. Most of us are not familiar with how a screen reader navigates a web page. So I want to step into someone's shoes for a minute and show you how that works. Hopefully the um, video will work here for us. Nope. All right, well, it was worth a shot, right? So what we're not able to hear so well is that as they're tabbing through, instead of hearing New York, they're hearing link, link, link. So this website isn't set up in a way that someone using a screen reader can hear what they're trying to navigate. Instead of giving the information, it's saying, this is the link, this is the link, this is the link. Um, yeah. One of these days, we'll figure out how to make this video stuff work for you. Well, let's go on to, here's my mouse. OK, well, here's what I can show you. This is what a GeorgiaGov web page looks like on a computer. This is a closer representation of what it looks like um, to a screen reader or a search engine. So way up at the top, it has search. There's a search form, your search button. We go through our links for your navigation. You are here. Here's the breadcrumbs. Here's my heading, and so on. So none of the decoration, none of the color is there, right? And even more accurately, this is what your page looks like to a screen, re screen reader or a search engine, right? All the, all the code that we don't have to think about. It'll skip through all the stuff that it doesn't need that's just talking about the color or the layout. And that search engine th can then pick up the text behind an image or um, a form, a form field to actually help someone navigate. But they're not going to see any of this stuff, right? A search engine screen reader isn't going to pick up an image or text that's saved as an image. A cute little ASCII rose here, it's not going to be translated as a rose. It's going to be ampersand, or sorry, at symbol, dash, dash, greater than, 
dash, dash, dash. It's not going to pick up that context. This brings to mind an old Shakespearean saying, a rose by any other name won't show up in Google search results without textual representation. We all learned that in lit class, right? I mean, I did. Google even says, use a text browser, such as Lynx. That's one of the um, screen reader tools that a lot of people use to examine your website. Most spiders see your site much as Lynx would. So if features such as JavaScript, cookies, session IDs, frames, DHTML, or Flash keep you from seeing your entire site in a text browser, then spiders may have trouble crawling it. Did you catch that? Search engine spiders cannot access the JavaScript and the Flash and the frames and the cookies on your website. It's not just an accessibility concern, right? This is an SEO concern as well. So don't use them if you can help it. And if you have to use JavaScript, for example, make sure that it enhances the experience, that it adds to it, and doesn't rely on it. So I should be able to get everything I need on the page, even without that JavaScript that may fancy things up a little bit. One great thing about the GeorgiaGov web platform is that a lot of this is already built in for you on the site. So when we built the platform, we tested for to make sure the search fields were accessible and easy to access. We included skip navigation links up at the top so that a screen reader can jump through all the navigation and get right to the content of a page. We tested for color contrast. Um, we use JavaScript that enhances the key functions, but you can access what you need without it. Um, there's no frames. There's no flash. We have fields for image alt text. And um, there's really no cool extra features until we vetted them to make sure that it's going to be accessible, that it's going to work for everybody. And we're actively working to even improve upon what we already have. So we're right now testing our color contrast and fonts so that we can improve on them and make them even more accessible than they are. This is going to take no work on your part at all. One day you're going to come into work and you're going to get a newsletter email from us and it's going to say, great news. We've increased the accessibility with the color contrast on your website. Done. Right? Pretty awesome. All right. But there's always a catch, right? We can do whatever we can on that back end, on the themes. But as much trouble as that saves you, there's still a lot of work that it takes to make your website accessible that's on the content side. That's something that you guys are going to need to do to make the rest of the content, right? Content is king, to make that part of it accessible. <sighs> I don't know, guys. Seems like a lot of work. I mean, who really cares if my website's accessible, right? So here's the thing. If you're providing government services to constituents, you're legally required to make your content accessible. Federally, it's a law. It may not be a law for the state yet, but it's coming. And it is required under the IT policy standards and guidelines for the state of Georgia. So it's something you got to do. A lot of you are noticing that eligibility for federal grants hinges on your content being accessible. So we've gotten some questions about that already. And um, really, you're better off being ahead of this, right? Being proactive and making sure your content's accessible before someone comes complaining. Um, that might seem like just sort of like a vague warning, but there's been a lot of lawsuits recently. Um, a parent recently sued the Seattle Public School District because she couldn't access the resources online that she needed to to be able to help her children with their homework. Um, these are, you know, small stories, but they're becoming more prevalent. It's going to happen a lot more. So it's just good to be ahead of it. So hopefully I've given you some good reasons to care about having accessible content. Now let's go to work. Let's do it. So what are some things that you need to do to make your web websites accessible? You need to use clear and simple language. Make sure your link text is useful. Alt text for images, transcripts for audio, captioning and transcripts for video, tables for tabular data and only for tabular data, and um, use semantic markup. I'm going to talk about all these a little bit more. So, Use the clearest and simplest language appropriate for a site's content. Peter talked about this a lot already, right? Simplify, cut it down, make it easy to read. Um, 
if your website contains the clearest and simplest language appropriate, it's probably also using those same keywords that someone would type into Google when they're looking for your site or looking for that information. So you're killing two birds with one stone. Um, so clear and simple language makes it more SEO friendly, more accessible, and more mobile friendly. All of that's going to increase the likelihood that they find what they need on your site and decrease the likelihood that they're going to call you looking for it, right? This is valuable stuff with real measurable value. Have I convinced y'all to clean up your content yet? All right, the next thing is useful link text. So click here, not so useful. Apply for child support, super useful. I know where this is going to take me. Um, as far as an accessibility concern, someone who's using a screen reader, if they're going through, they can actually say, list all of the links on this page. And if all the links are click here, click here, click here, see this, read more, it's not going to give them much information about where they're going, right? Um, someone who is going through using a screen reader, for you it may not be that big a deal to click here and find out, oh, that's not the page I wanted, and then go back. But using the back button isn't always so easy for someone um, with disabilities. So we want to provide as much information as we can in that link text of where they're going. Not only that, again, SEO, right? Search engine optimization. So Google rewards you for linking to useful content from other websites, and it's going to use that text to help index and um, plan what's important about that page. Another thing to keep in mind is alt text for images. Later today, Rachel's going to walk you through how to add alt text so that your screen readers and search engines know what they're looking for. Um, our key today is that any image that's providing additional value for the page needs alternate text there. So for you, when you're adding content to the site, you're going to go to, in your WYSIWYG, you add an image, and you'll see somewhere on the screen, it'll say alt text, and that's where you type that in. Don't put in the file name, right? Put in an actual phrase explaining what it is, something that adds value. Why did you add it to the page? Well, here's the information about it that is why I added it to the page. But for images that are just there for decoration, which Peter talked about, we don't really need them for decoration anyways, but when you have them, um, it doesn't need any alt text at all. You can leave that field blank, and that way the screen, screen reader will skip over it and go on to the actual content of your page. Oh, man. Nobody told me there was going to be a pop quiz. All right. I do have a couple t-shirts. If anybody's going to answer these, this is our um, to alt text or not to alt text. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous alt descriptions, <laughs> or to take arms against a sea of empty tags and by opposing end them. Is this girl for real? All right. Seriously, let's review some options. So. Here's an example of a list of links with nice little images next to it. What do you think? Do these images need alt text? No. <laughs> All right. We're going to say no on this one. So if I don't have the images, do I still know what that's going to do, what Tag Renewals is going to take me to if I don't have alt text or if I don't have a picture? So it's not providing extra big value, right? So see, this is why I did the pop quiz. It's not so obvious all the time. Um, yeah, so I don't need to know dollar sign to know that what pay insurance penalty is going to do. I don't need to know car, icon of a car, to know what Tag Renewals are going to do. So let's skip the alt text on these. And like I mentioned, if you leave it blank, Drupal will put in alt equals nothing. If you're not on our platform, which some of you are not, if you're hand coding this, you actually type in alt equals nothing. If you d so basically, in the back end, for the couple of us that are interested in this part, in the back end, if you don't have the alt attribute, then a screen reader may just read off the whole file name or the image name, which we know is not going to provide any value. But alt equals blank will kind of tell it to skip over it and keep going. All right, well, let's try another one. This is something that's on our, um, our portal, in a, portal Interactive website. We have little 
um, highlights of some of our agency uh, websites. So here we've got one for Georgia Bureau of Investigation. This link takes us to sort of an overview of that site. What about this seal? To alt text or not to alt text? All right, who was the first one that said no? <laughs> Don't! <laughs> Almost. All right, yeah. So if we think about, like, what might I say here? I might say seal, Georgia Bureau of Investigation seal, GBI seal. Right below it, it says Georgia Bureau of Investigation, right? So I don't need to say that for the image right before the text. So we can skip alt text on that one, too. Here's another one of those blurbs we have. What do we think? Alt text or no alt text? It's tricky, huh? Everyone got quiet. Um, so here's what I'm thinking on this one, right? This is for the redesign of Georgia Gov. But what is this? This isn't a seal. This isn't a logo. It's a picture of a desktop and a mobile phone and a tablet. And they all show the website, but a different view of that website. And that's explaining, it's adding value to what we did in the redesign of Georgia Gov. So this one, I might think that it's useful to add some alt text. So it's a computer, a tablet, a mobile phone showing different versions of the same website. That's what we did for the redesign of Georgia Gov. How about this one? This is all one big picture. Alt text or no alt text? Yeah. Alt text, absolutely alt text. I didn't come up with an example for that one. You have to extrapolate in your heads what that would be. But there's a lot of information on this image. So counts by application type. But I need to explain even more, right? I should probably put in there, you know, cuts, 147 applications, 23%. So we actually want to explain what the content is for that image. All right, great job, guys. Um, your handout has links to some great resources, too, on when and how to use alt text for images. So I recommend that you go and look at those um, when you get back. There's a couple of um, articles that are really good about here's where it would be useful, here's where it's not so useful. So it'll be a good review. Another place on your platform website where you might add alt text is in your structured image area. So you might remember a little while back we did our... Um, responsive refresh for the sites. And when we made the sites responsive, right, so they'll shrink down for mobile and expand, um, we added in the structured image. And that goes to the top of your page. It's nice and big on your desktop, and then it shrinks down small on your mobile device. We have two fields there. There's a space for a caption and a space for alt text. The caption will show below the image, and it'll be visible for everybody. The alt text would not be. That would be just in the back end. So in this example, pick one. If you want everyone to see the description, put it in your caption area. If not, put it in your alt text. Don't put the same thing in both fields because that would just be redundant, right? A screen reader would just hear the same thing twice. Okay. Next up, don't use tables for information that you can communicate easily with plain text. So, Here's this meeting schedule, but all it is is a list of dates and links to some information for each date. So it actually gets a little confusing in a table, right? Not to mention the table has to scroll. You'll see I have a little scroll bar because there's some stuff cut off there at the end. So I don't want to use tables if I can communicate that same information without a table. I can just have a list of links here and it gets the same point across. Um, while we're at it, you don't want to use colors to color coding as the only way to get information across. So in this example, they have red for when it's canceled, but they also say the word canceled. So the red is sort of adding to. It's not the only way you're getting information across. Um, while we're talking about color, be careful of red-green color combinations because a lot of people have red-green color blindness and can't differentiate well between the two. Um, and make sure your co color contrast um, on your pages is strong. Most of this you all don't have to think about because it's built into your theme. Um, but for those of you that sometimes want to you know, hand code some extra color and it's just good to keep that in mind. <coughs> now, when you have tabular data, absolutely 
use tables, right? That's the place to do that. So this would be a really good example of a place where I need a table. When you do, make sure that you mark your header rows. So when you're hand coding, there's a way to mark header rows. Also in the Drupal platform, you can mark if you have a header row or a header column or both. Where that's going to help a screen reader is when they get down to June 24th, 2015. Well, what is that? Well, it's the board action date for the new chapter 391, blah, blah, blah. So if you've marked the header rows, the screen reader can tell them what that information is. Here's where you do that in Drupal. When I go in to add a table, click my little icon for it, or if I already have a table and now I've said, oh, let me go add a header row, you can right click and choose your table properties. From these table properties, here's my rows and my columns, here's my headers. I can say first row, I can say first column, or first row and first column. Um, also make sure you use your caption. So this caption will show up on the page above the table and it's going to add value for everyone explaining what that table is and connected to that table. And then as you're chunking sections of content within your pages, right, that's part of our simplifying and bringing it all down. When you're chunking, be sure to use your header rows or your heading tags to mark when you have a new heading. Um, not just making the text bold, but actually mark it as a heading if you have a subheading on your page. This is called semantic markup. So it's providing HTML tags that identify more information in the background about that, about that text. Now, on the Drupal platform, heading one and heading two were already used within the page. So you would start at heading three. See those examples, that's heading two, but you would start at heading three. Um, and then if you have another level of subheadings, you would go down to heading four. You don't want to jump you know, between um, heading three and heading five. You actually want to stick within the order. Um, if you have an address, you can actually use the address um, tag to specify that that's an address. Again, that's adding value for your search engine and for your screen readers. Um, and so similarly, just for reference, normal is what it says when you just have paragraph text. That'll just mark it as a paragraph. That's normal. Everything else is down from that drop down list. If you're building forms by hand, so if you're not using Drupal web forms, if you're not using Wufu, both of those do this accessibility for you. But if you're building forms by hand, you also want to make sure that you use the label tag to mark the label text that's attached to each of those form fields. So all those extra considerations. All right. And you also need to make your documents accessible. Those PDFs and those Word documents that we already talked about, we have so many of. You might think like, okay, well, I have to do this for my web pages, but you know, I don't have to worry about for my PDFs. I just, those are just done, right? No, nope, you gotta make those accessible too. So Peter talked about this, but I'm gonna re repeat it again. Anytime a PDF can be made into a web page, it should be made into a web page. It'll be more accessible, more mobile friendly, more search engine friendly, more user friendly. Put simply, more people are gonna see your content if it's a web page than they will if it's a PDF, if it's a document. I'm gonna talk about this for a couple of minutes, y'all. We have a lot of PDFs. Last year, the World Bank decided to ask an important question of their policy reports that they put out. They said, is anybody actually reading these? So they ran their analytics. Here's what they found. Now think about this, the World Bank, they spend a lot of money and a lot of time with a lot of resources researching and writing these big policy reports, then they upload them as a PDF to their website. They found that a third of them had never been downloaded. It's a lot of time and money and resources devoted to something that nobody is reading. 40% um, had been downloaded less than 100 times ever. Only 13% had seen more than 250 downloads in their lifetime. So this is like Peter's um, long neck, but the opposite, right? <laughs> this is all the stuff that nobody's ever looked at. Um, if this is the track record for the World Bank policy reports, how do you think your PDFs and um, press releases are faring, right? So you have a press release, make it a web page. Drupal has a press content type that's built exactly for that. 
The neat thing about that is it has, it, you know, you publish your um, press content item, it shows up immediately on the press page, shows up immediately on your, um, shows up immediately on your home page, and then there's also an RSS feed um, that people can subscribe to that will show up immediately there too. So that way people are getting the information they need in a timely manner. Um, if you have a page of instructions, an FAQ page, you can make that a web page too. So just because the original was a PDF doesn't mean it has to stay as a PDF. Now PDFs are okay sometimes. There's gonna be times that you have to use a PDF. So if I have like this big crazy table, it's gonna make more sense to leave it as a document. Um, forms that have to be in a specific um, format, especially like a tax form, makes sense to have a PDF, or something that is intended for someone to print out, also makes sense to make that a PDF. But even an annual report can be converted to web pages, like Peter talked about before. All right, I'm not gonna try showing this video because it probably won't play right for us. But let me tell you really quickly, when you've got, um, and I can send an email out of the resources for these, if a screen reader reads a PDF that's not saved for accessibility, then Acrobat doesn't actually break it out as individual, individual words even, or individual paragraphs. So having this paragraph and that paragraph, your screen reader might just go straight across. And even then, it'll just kind of jumble up the letters in different combinations instead of actually making the word information one word and you one word. It might jumble them together. So if you don't export a PDF for accessibility, it may not be accessible at all. I've included links in your resource sheet in case you missed the workshop that AMAC did for us at the last GovTalks. We actually have a web guide that goes through more about accessibility. But the quick overview, You've got to have your alt text for images in your Word documents too. Uh, make header rows and columns in your tables. Use the header styles, sans serif fonts when possible. And then when you convert that Word document to a PDF, you actually have to go through and check a box that says create an accessible tag PDF, or else it just may not be. Um, for your PDF forms, like we talked about those tax forms, in Acrobat you need to go through and set the tab, tab order and labels for each of those form fields too so that people can actually use it. All right, I'm done talking about PDFs, y'all. Breathe a sigh of relief. All right, so multimedia is all the rage now, right? We can do it so quickly and easily. It's so easy to pull out a phone and do a video and edit it and actually make it look good and put it online. Um, you know, it's a nice way to get you know, get information out there. People are finding new ways to reach, reach constituents with um, video and audio. Um, but they also need to be accessible. So to make your audio accessible, you need to include a text transcript with it. I like way the, the way the NPR does this. I think this is a good example. Here they have their link to the audio. And then below it, they have their full transcript. It's all on the same page, so you know they're connected. SEO friendly, right? Now Google knows the information that's in your audio so it can actually index the page correctly. When you have your transcript, along with just the words that people are saying, you need to include things like laughter. Here they have, there's a sound bite of a song. They tell you what song. Here you hear somebody singing. You know, mark if there's explosions. I know we all have explosions in our videos, right? Um, and this isn't just for SEO. It's not just for, um, you know, accessibility. This is just for anybody that doesn't want to have to listen to something right now. I don't know about you guys, but I have young kids and they always want something. Every once in a while, they'll actually just, like go play by themselves and be quiet and it's amazing. And maybe I'll sit for a minute and I'll kind of catch up on some things. But if I were to start playing audio, they would stop what they were doing and come over and want to see what I was doing. And I want them to keep playing. So <laughs> it's so nice. So I don't play audio at any cost if my kids are around because I want them to keep doing what they're doing, right? So if I don't have a transcript, it's going to move on. I'm never going to consume that content, right? Similar for video content. You want to include a transcript, but this time the transcript should not only have the audio, but it should also explain any images 
just like you would with your alt text. If I have a chart, I need to explain what's in that chart in the transcript. And then I also need to include closed captions for audio and multimedia content. That closed caption will show up in the middle of the video. Again, indicating the laughter and all those explosions that I know all your videos have. What's really nice now is that YouTube can help you with this. You don't have to have fancy equipment to be able to add closed captioning to your pages or to your videos. If you're uploading your videos to YouTube, which is what we recommend and our, um, our platform supports you embedding YouTube videos, you upload your video in your video managers, you go and you find your list. You have this little drop down arrow for edit and you can choose subtitles and CC for your closed captions. YouTube automatically generates your closed captions. See, it says English automatic. Now I click on that and I will see what my closed captioning looks like. Don't just rely on YouTube's closed captioning. Um, it can be really hilarious what YouTube thinks that you've said in your video. But this gets you started, right? It breaks up by time code and now you can actually go in and change your text to what you actually said instead of what Drupal or what um, YouTube thinks you said. Pretty cool, huh? Love this. All right. Okay, it's a lot. I know, we're asking a lot, right? But the benefits are real and necessary. So how do I make this a priority, right? Where do I start? I know that no one has two weeks to just kind of sit down and clean up all their content. But maybe you can block off 30 minutes a day for as long as it takes, right? Just kind of schedule something in. 30 minutes, four days a week, whatever it is. Um, like Peter said, you can run a content inventory. Um, we use a tool called Content Insight that um, we think is really useful. It connects with your Google Analytics, or you can open a ticket and ask us to run a content inventory for you. Then you can bring that into, let's say we like to use Google Spreadsheets that we can share with other content managers on our team, and then you can kind of go through and mark what you keep, what needs to be cleaned up, what needs to be accessified, and then you can just mark off when it's done, and you can kind of keep a running tally on what you need to do. The great thing is that once you've gotten into the habit of cleaning up your old content, it's not as hard to do it with your new content, right? It just becomes habit. It's just built into your workflow. So before long, you just start reaping the benefits of making it all accessible and mobile friendly. Um, and then when it comes to creating things like new audio and video, you know it's coming. You build that into your time frame and your workflow to add in the transcripts and the closed captioning. So it's not as big of a lift once you build it into your process. All right, so to recap, you want to be sure your, con your content is accessible, right? Search engine friendly, ready for everybody. So for your text, keep it simple or simplify if it's not already. For your multimedia, um, provide it in multiple formats. So transcripts, closed captioning, and your multimedia version. And um, for your platform, make sure you have a web platform that makes the code portion of your accessibility easy. Don't forget your resources sheet has a lot of links to some things that can kind of add to what we talked about and help you on your way. So and once again, I want to thank you all for your time.